It is so great to see everybody. I wanted to, uh, we had a delegates meeting uh, just last night, I guess it was, and um, somebody mentioned in that delegates meeting that, that there were some requests to use one of these evenings for uh, hymn sing. And after hearing that, I'm ready for that. So that's a plan. We're going to put that on the calendar. I think it may already be. But we're going to use one of our evenings for a hymn sing, so I very much look forward to that. I, I, um, I hope, like me, you have learned not to take this opportunity to be together for granted after a year of being apart. We had the first brothers meeting that we've had in, I think, almost two years, um, year and a half at least. And um, I just, I'm very glad to be here. And what I want to talk about, I've been wanting to talk about for quite some time. I actually had this scheduled, and then I was out of town, so, I, so we, we had to adjust course. But I, I don't know if you remember, but I had sent out a survey to everybody and asked everybody to fill it out. I don't know how many did. I don't think as many people are here filled out the surveys. But enough people did that we can talk about it. And what the question was, was just tell me three times that you remember someone ministering to you. And what I'm after is just like, what sticks in your mind? Like when you think of people ministering to you and your life, things that have made a difference in how you live your Christianity, what are the things that come to mind like first off? So I want to read through these. Uh, pay attention especially to the verbs, like what people did, because that's what we're after. So I'll just read through. I'm not going to read all the answers. I just want to read some quick little excerpts from these um, and see if you can pick up on the same theme that I did. Uh, someone prayed on the phone with me, um, told me how to think right, listened to me, uh, brought me the word of God and admonished me, um, told me to rest and encouraged me. Having someone to talk, cry, and pray with fellowship, having conversations, gathering wisdom, seeing what needs to be done and pitching in, counsel, help with my children, helped me, read with me, brought me meals and gifts and encouraged me, gave advice, helped with my house, um, had me for a meal, visited and listened, visited and sang, interactions with people, taking care of me when I was sick, teaching me how to pray, celebrating important events in my life, praying with me, listening to my problems and giving me counsel, brought me food in a time of sickness, answered some questions, spent time visiting, helped me, took me out to lunch and spoke with me about questions, set up time with me to ha answer questions, checked in on me, um, helped me look through my pa some past events and helped me, prayed with me, invited me to be with their family, uh, answered questions, encouraged me, more questions, prayed for me, gave me courage, confronted me, um, took care of me, and helped me with my struggles, wept with me, mediated a conflict. What's the common thread? Here's why I wanted to talk about. I've been hearing for for the last several months, there's been a lot of conversation in the church, and I think it's a healthy conversation to have, about what is the role of women in the church? Where do women fit into the ministry? Like we talk, we have men, we, we have men who preach and men who teach. We believe that men should lead their homes and men should lead the church. Where is the place for women? And I wanted this exercise specifically because what I, what I suspected actually happened. Not a one of those message, one of those things that stuck out in anybody's life was preached a really good sermon, made a decision in the church that was meaningful to me. The places that people were touched by ministry, every woman in this room can do every one of those things. 
Not a single thing in that list is forbidden from women. So when we look at the most important things that those who answered had to say about what the church has done to minister to their life, it's something that all of us can do. Nothing's held back. There's nothing missing. There's nothing lacking. Not a one of those responses is something that I can do that you sisters can't. And that was really encouraging to me because I feel that way about the church. See, I, I, present, I come to this mess, I come to this discussion and this issue uh, n- not objective. I- I'm not approaching this issue like Paul did, who's dis- who doesn't have a family, who doesn't have a wife, who doesn't have children. I have seven daughters. And when I talk about how the church should, should interact with women, where they should fit, I'm thinking of my own women, my own sisters, my own wife, who I think is one of the best people that I know. And, and if, if I felt like to be faithful to the scriptures was somehow disparaging or limiting to women, I would really struggle with that. But I don't. So I want to talk about that tonight. <clears throat> Let's start uh, where we should always start with the scriptures. I want to look just at, I want to take a quick perusal through some scriptures just for the sake of context. They're nothing, nothing you aren't going to be familiar with. I'm not pulling out any little gems from the recesses of the scriptures. I just want to ground ourselves in some text. Let's start with 1 Corinthians. Looking at women's place in the church, that's the question we're asking. Um, I actually want to start in 1 Corinthians 14. We'll go back to 11, but let's look in 1 Corinthians 14 first. It's really dark in here. Maybe it's just me. Uh, 1 Corinthians 14. Here we are. Uh, Starting in verse 34. This is at the end of... He's talking about how the gifts should be used in the church. and, And most recently above this, he's talking about prophets and prophesying. And the order that's supposed to come from that. He says, God's not the author of confusion. And then in verse 34, he says, Let your women keep silent in the churches... For it's not permitted unto them to speak. That's strong language. But they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. And if they, if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home. For it is a shame for women to speak in the church. Um, let's flip over to 1 Timothy. First Timothy, and we're going to look at two, obviously. Probably saw that coming. Verse 9, In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with braided hair or gold or pearls or costly array, but which becometh women professing godliness. This is how women who profess godliness should appear. With good works... Let the women learn in silence with all subjection, but I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. For Adam was first formed, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression, notwithstanding she should be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith and charity with hol- and holiness with sobriety. Thanks for trying. Let's look at uh, 1 Peter, since we're back here. Chapter 3. Uh, I think it's worth noting in that, in that passage we just read, that list of descriptions. I just was talking to somebody about, about the issue of baptism, and what I was saying was that, what, the point I was trying to articulate and make is that when we read the Scriptures, especially the New Testament, we ought to just re- be able to read them and say amen. I'm not talking about, talking about taking them out of context. I just mean we ought to be able to read them at face value and say, Amen, this is right. First Peter, let's go there. Chapter 3. <clears throat> 
verse 1. It says, now this is about wives. Likewise, you wives be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives. L let me introduce an idea here. We, we know, most of us know, that there's not really a word wife in Greek. There's not really a word husband. It's just man and woman. So in, in, in the text itself, this just reads women and men. And, I, and so we have to make a contextual choice to decide if it means woman or wife, man or husband. But it says, but I, I'm not challenging this particular translation. I think it's perfectly valid, especially because it's talking about a lot of the family stuff. But that's an interesting thing to read through this the other way and just read it in the, in the textual way. Likewise, you women be in subjection to your own men. So there's, there's the contextual clue of why it should be wife and husband, because it's your own man. That if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives, of the women. While they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear, whose adorning, let it not be that outward adorning of plating the hair, of wearing of gold, of putting on apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart, and that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God, of great price. For after this manner in the old time, the holy women also, who trusted in God, adorned themselves. They made themselves beautiful this way. They decorated themselves this way. Being in subjection unto their own husbands, even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are, as long as you do well, and are not afraid with any amazement. Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. Finally, be ye all of one mind. So women do this, men do this, now all of you do this. Be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another, Love as brethren, be pitiful, be courteous, not rendering evil for evil, railing for railing, but contrarywise blessing, knowing that ye are thereunto called, that ye should inherit a blessing. Okay, N now I want to go to 1 Corinthians, back to 1 Corinthians 11. I know that we could make a sermon out of each one of those passages uh, to talk about what's, what God's trying to communicate there. But I just want those as kind of like a backdrop for where we're starting. And then I want to look at 1 Corinthians 11, because I think I've been realizing more and more this is a critical text, a critical issue for understanding. The question remains, right? Like, why should it be so? What, what does Eve have to do with how the church interacts between women and men now? Why is that relevant? Why is it mentioned twice? What's the point to all of this? Why should it be thus? I think that's okay to ask. And I think there's an explanation. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, it says, Be followers of me, of me, even as I also am of Christ. Now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things and keep the ordinances as I delivered them to you. But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. We'll go ahead and read through, but I want to come back to that. Every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonors his head. But every woman that prays or prophesies with her head uncovered, dishonors her head. For that is even all one as if she were shaven. For if the woman be not covered, let her also be shorn. But if it be a shame for a woman to be shorn or shaven, let her be covered. For a man indeed ought not to cover his head, for as much as he is the image and glory of God, but the woman is the glory of the man. Now this is, a, this is a little bit paradoxical, right? Because in the Genesis account, it's clear that, that God is creating them in their image. Like he and she are created both in the image of God. But here, Paul's making a distinction between Adam was created in God's image and she was created, Eve was created in his image. Uh, for this cause, uh, let's back up here. 
For man indeed ought not to cover his head, uh, for he is the image and glory of God, but the woman is the glory of the man, for the man is not of the woman, but the woman of the man. That's why he's putting it in those terms. Neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. For this cause ought the women ought the women to have power on her head because of the angels. Nevertheless, neither is the man without the woman, neither the woman without the man in the Lord. For as the woman is of the man, even so is the man also by the woman, but all things of God. Okay, so what does all this have to do with creation? And what I, what I, happened, up, what I happened upon was that English is funny, right? We use different words in different senses. Like, I can love cheeseburgers and I can love my wife. Those are both the same word. They can have very different meanings. And there's another sense in which we can use a lot of words. And one of the words that has a complicated meaning based on its context is the word order. You can give an order. You can put things in order. There's all kinds of ways in which we can use order. And when, when I'm talking about order tonight in regards to this passage, I want to talk about like numerical order, like one, two, three, four, like things in order. And that's what the underlying mean of, meaning of this word in English is. Like if you have orders, right, like in the military you're given orders, that means they're coming from the order above you, the set above you, the, the level of authority above you. And those orders come down to you and it's ordered. It's orderly to follow the orders. All these words come from the same kind of underlying principle. And I would maintain that this is the key to understanding gender as it pertains to relationships in the church. That all of these things have to do with how the world is ordered. Now, Press pause right there in everything I've said, and let's talk about something else. So we have order, right? Why do I say that that matters? The reason that this whole logic starts is because of the Godhead. And I think that why a lot of confusion has come into the church around gender, around order, what's orderly for us, is because we don't properly understand the Trinity well. What do I mean by that? I mean that a lot of us grew up with bad analogies of the Trinity. Like, uh, like an egg has three parts, but it's one thing. Like water has, has, can be steam or liquid or ice. These are bad analogies for the Trinity. I mean, they serve some kind of mm, juvenile purpose, but they aren't actually good analogies. If you want to, if you want to talk, talk about uh, what's the result of that, the result of these bad analogies is what we call an egalitarian view of the Trinity. And what that means is that there's, there's literally no distinction between the three members of the Trinity. This is usually represented as a triangle. Like you can flip a triangle any direction. It doesn't make any difference. There's no difference between this corner and this corner and this corner. It's all the same thing. They just are in three different places, even though it's one thing. But that's not how the Trinity works. It's not how the Godhead works. And I'll, I'll justify these claims in a minute. Let me tell you what I think Orthodox Trinitarian theology is and why it matters. In, in the way that the church first began to talk about the Trinity, about the Godhead itself, they were using a different way for understanding that based on what Jesus had said about his life and his ministry and the, how the scriptures were relating to him. And let me give you a proper analogy of the Trinity. Imagine a mountainside out in wherever. There's a beautiful mountain, and on that mountain, there's a spring that bubbles up out of the ground. And that spring turns into a creek, and that creek turns into a river, and it finally ends in a big lake. Now, why is this a better analogy for the Trinity? There's no difference. What's the difference? Where do you make a distinction between the water that's in the river and the water that's in the lake? It's one water, right? There's no difference between the waters. It's all water. What's the difference between the water in the creek and the water in the fountain? It's the same stuff. It's one source. It's one thing. It's one water. 
But the reason this is different and the reason it's important is that because without the fountain, you have no creek and you have no lake. Now, if you take that analogy and you make it eternal without any beginning, this is like the Trinity. This is actually used in a very famous writing on the Trinity called Against Praxius by Tertullian. He's dealing with a, a heresy in the Church of Rome. He's dealing with a couple of heresies in the Church of Rome. But one of them is he has two problems in, in the churches. One is Arianism, and on Arianism, Jesus is a created being like the angels. And the other is modalism. And in modalism, it's like these egalitarian, trinitarian notions. There's no distinction between the Father and the Son. When Jesus was on earth, there was no God in heaven. That's modalism. God exists in one mode at one time. These are opposite heresies. And, and the work against Praxius is written to, to cut a line straight between them. He uses the terms monarchy and economy. There's a lot in Praxius that's, that's very important for Christian thought on, on these ideas. It's articulated very well, and he uses a lot of these kinds of analogies. But what he's trying to preserve is what Jesus says in his own ministry. Have you ever thought about the way Jesus describes his relationship to his Father? Without the Father, I can do what? Nothing. Nothing. No man knows but who? The Father. Jesus uses a lot of terminology about his relationship to his Father that is dependent. Now, it's very important that we define Jesus as God because of all that he's doing. No, nobody can forgive sins but God. The resurrection is contingent on his divinity. It's essential to Christian doctrine that Jesus is a part of the Godhead, but it's also essential to Christian doctrine that he comes from the Father. He is the only begotten son of the father he comes from now what does it mean to come from it means that he has an order with the godhead the father is the first in order of the godhead everything comes from him and this i would say is why the apostle continues to refer to creation and the fall to discuss how our parameters are around decorum between the genders and what we should and shouldn't be doing as men and women because of this order that's laid out in the beginning. Why should Jesus do what the Father says? Why should he be under the Father? Why should he submit to the Father? Why should he come from the Father? Because he's next in order from. And Corinthians is a description of order. Father, son, man, woman. That's the order in which they come. Now, order is not an expression of value. Is Jesus less important, less God, less valued than the Father? No. Thomas says, my Lord and my God to Jesus at the, after the resurrection. And we can say the same. He's, he's uh, the express image of the Godhead bodily. He is what we know. He's the most tangible aspect and part of God. And his value is not any less than the Father's. Now, let's think about value propositions. Is man worth less than Christ? In God's economy, he's not, right? Because what did God, what was God willing to do? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever should believe on him should not perish but have everlasting life. He was willing to exchange us for him in that sense. So our value is not less than Christ's. In fact, he was willing to sacrifice Christ for our good. If anything, that means God is valuing us above the sacrifice. I say all this because if we're, if we're going to derive our order from this text, and I think that we should, if we're going to understand how we should operate as men, as women, based on our order according to God, we have to run this story both ways. 
What that means is that my wife's experience with me should be similar to man's experience to Christ, should be similar to Christ's experience with the Father. That it runs both directions. Now, I thought of this graphically the last time I was teaching on it. Um, and a way for me to understand this is like, what role then does submission play? Why does Jesus submit to the Father and in what senses? Why does man submit to Christ and in what senses? Why does a woman submit to her husband and in what senses? How does this make sense? And what I would say is that the Garden of, the, of, Eden, uh, the Garden of Gethsemane is a good kind of snapshot of the value of submission in these chains of order. What you have is Jesus' legitimate desire. I don't want to hurt. I don't want to be crucified. I don't want to experience the separation and the death that's coming. Those are, there's nothing wrong with those desires. Yet, those desires are in conflict with the next order above him, the order of the Father. And in that moment, he takes his legitimate desires and he says, not my will, but thy will be done. In that view, what happens in that moment is that submission is a conflict resolution tool. It's when there's an impasse, when there's, when there's, when there's two competing interests, submission is how you answer the dilemma. That's how, that's how it works. In all of the submission orders that there are, whether we're talking about state and citizen, parent and child, husband and wife, father and son, divine father and divine son, submission is when there's a conflict of wills, a way to resolve that conflict and keep order. Keep order. What I would say is that we've been far underselling what these things mean, not just to the church, but to the world. When we, when we are in order, we are literally displaying God's order to the world, the natural and supernatural world, because of the angels. We are a demonstration of God's intention and order. A mirror of his relationship with his son happens in our relationships with one another. In our relationships as the church to our to our husband, Christ. We mirror all this. We literally create order through our relationships in the world around us. That's a big deal. <clears throat> if you distinguish these two ways of understanding the Godhead, these egalitarian notions of there's no difference, it's just one is over here and one is over there and one is over there, then there's no way to understand the rest of what is talked about in Corinthians. It has nothing to do. If that's what the Trinity is, then it makes no sense in regards to why this order should exist. But if we properly understand the way I think we should understand the Trinity, then these issues of order and who comes from what, in what order, is a very, very important thing because it helps us maintain order. Um, so that's an important point. We need to understand Oh, I didn't tell you what I, was, what I, what I came up with last time. So in, in, in understanding submission, like how does submission work? How does it function? And why is this not just totalitarianism? Like the, 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 the danger, the fear, and the misuse of this has led to some horrible things. Can we all admit that? Like there are some horrible things that have happened in humanity and in the church specifically, even in our day, uh, we probably all have a story somewhere of some tyrant who's using these scriptures to bully and browbeat women in his life to cause a wreck and a havoc. And it's not orderly. It's the opposite of order. I've seen it. 
I'm sure you have too. So what prevents that? What prevents that is understanding what the intention of these things are and that this, this order of operation runs both directions. Here's how I came across this. I was thinking about this very issue and I thought, is there a single time in my entire life, my whole life, my 43 years, where I feel like Jesus has forced me to do a single thing? Have I ever experienced God overbearing me and pushing down on me and saying, you have to do this? I do not have a single experience in my whole life with Christ being coerced or forced by him. I have never had that experience. I do not read anywhere in the entirety of the scriptures God forcing Christ to do a single thing. I have never seen it. I've never read it. I don't believe it exists. If so, then it's never appropriate for to use this to justify force or compulsion. So graphically, when you think of this chain, father, son, man, woman, submission always rises from the bottom. It's a willful choice to bend, to literally yield my will because of my order. And coercion, whenever it runs down, is automatically a Gentile authority structure. I don't care if it's in a Christian home. I don't care if it's in a Christian package. I don't care if they're using Christian scriptures to justify it. If it's force coming down from above, you're under me, you have to do, here's why, or else, that is always 100% Gentile and not, thereby not Christian. This is a necessary component for understanding this teaching. Submission is a choice that comes up from below. Always. Okay, so that's, that's basically um, my grounding for like how I think we should begin to approach these issues of women in the church, their proper place, and, and how to think of ministry. This is where the conversation should begin, in these, like, I think, kind of like core texts around these issues. But let's think specifically, here's the thought experiment that I did today. Who are the women that come to mind, to your mind, in the New Testament? Just think for a minute. I'm not, it's a rhetorical question, I'll, I'll run through a list, but just think of the women that come to your mind in the scriptures. The first one in my mind is Mary, the mother of Jesus. What did she do? She yielded. She obeyed. She prophesied. She entreated Christ in his ministry. She followed him. She was a witness of his power and his works. Those things we know. I don't know what else she did, but those things we know. Philip had daughters. What did they do? They prophesied. Uh, Martha and Mary. There's several Marys, but Martha and Mary, Lazarus' sisters, what did they do? They ministered to Jesus and the apostles. They made space for them. They provided for them. They followed them. Women were the first at the tomb. They were literally the first evangelists. They were the first ones to relate the gospel. Anna was the first person to prophesy. In, in Jerusalem about, about Jesus as the Christ. Elizabeth is, is the first, the real first prophet when they were, both of the children were still in the womb. She prophesies. How about Phoebe? What was Phoebe's job? End of Romans, Paul commissions the church to receive Phoebe. He sent her with messages. In that sense, like she's the very generic word apostle. She's sent from Paul to do that. I don't think she's in the office of an apostle, but she's doing a job of being sent by the apostle. And there, he tells the church to receive her, give her whatever she needs to do what she's going to do. So she's doing something very tangibly, practically carrying messages from here to there. Um, 
Priscilla. Priscilla and Aquila. What did they do? They grabbed a hold of Apollos. They met Apollos and they said, let us show you the way more perfectly. And they took him in and they taught him. They, they, they shaped him into a minister for the church. A very dynamic, powerful minister in the church. So there we have a married team working with a man. Uh, Lydia, the seller of purple. She hears, she receives, and she provides for the church. Church meets in her home. She provides for the ministry of Paul. Chloe also houses the church. I hear from the house of Chloe that there'll be some among you, that there'll be division among you, and I partly believe it. Tryphena and Tryphosa are mentioned. They labor in the Lord, is what Paul says to them in Romans 16. How about Junia? Who's, who's, who's wrestled with Junia? You all know who I'm talking about, Junia? Andronicus and Junia? They're mentioned in, in, uh, in Romans. Let's look there. That's actually worth looking at. Romans. This is, a, this is a controversial little text, but it's worth taking a look at, I think. I think that's Romans 16. Um... Yes, in verse 7, salute Andronicus and Junia, my kinsmen and my fellow prisoners who are of note among the apostles who also were in Christ before me. Some have said that this Junia is a female name and is an apostle because of this commentary. The ESV actually reads, um, known to the apostles. And... It's controversial because Chrysostom mentions Junia as one of the apostles, but uh, several of Chrysostom's contemporaries think that Junia is a male name. So we don't have a whole lot to go off of here. But we know that, let's assume that Junia is a woman. Um, I, I don't believe for a lot of other reasons that, that a church planter office is open for a woman. So grant, if you grant that, which... You don't have to, but if you do, this is an important note. This woman is known to the apostles. She's someone of reputation with the apostles. She's, she, if Paul's mentioning her here, she has to be one of the earliest Christians, and she's an early confessor. She's already been in prison, a fellow prisoner. So this is a woman who's received and suffered for the Lord and his cause. Assuming it's a woman. Eunice and Lois, the mother and grandmother of Timothy, raise him in the scriptures. Dorcas is known for her good works and for her almsgiving. I think that that's... If, you, if, we take all those, if we take all those descriptions of all those women, I, 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 want our, I want our women to be like those women. There's, if you're a young lady and you're a part of Followers Away, it's wide open. I, I, there is so much work to do for any single person, man or woman. Let me share with you some of my experiences in ministering with women so that, so that we can ground this in something practical, right? Because I've heard this kind of stuff before and it's just kind of like, okay, well, what, do I, what am I supposed to do with that? Yeah, that, okay, that's nice. There's something for women to do. That's great. What is there to do? Let me share with you some of my experiences in ministering with women. Um, First of all, my, my wife has been a constant companion of my ministries. Now, I could start by saying, and this is a huge, huge component to my own ministry, that she makes my 
life possible. Like I have 12 children and I travel and I go places and I do things and I spent all day today preparing this message and all my house goes on because I have such a faithful woman at home to work in my home, to care for my children, to provide for, for our needs. All of that is an enormous ministry and I promise you that her reward is just as great as anything that I do. I, I, I promise you that the evaluation that God has of that, of that humble work that she does to make my work available. Jesus says, if you offer a cup of water in my name, you should receive a prophet's reward. To a prophet, you should receive a prophet's reward. The, the women who, like Mary and Martha, have always made the ministries of the church possible are are powerful women with spiritual resources in the kingdom of God. That's for sure. But that's not where we started. We didn't start with 12 children. Where we started is two roughneck street kids who just got born again. And when Eric and I first got born again, well, we didn't think anybody else could, should, or would listen to us. So we went to where we knew. Eric and I would go out all the time, uh, at least weekly. And we would go into the parks where the homeless people hung out, into the streets where we had lived, and we would buy people meals, and we would talk to them about the gospel. And there we were, side by side, sharing the gospel with anybody who would listen to us. The few, the dregs of the earth that we thought, well, nobody else is speaking to them, we will. That's where we began in ministry. And she was right there by my side, and her and I labored in the gospel together from, from the very beginning of our Christianity. And I'll tell you what happened just because it's a curious story. One time we were in the car with a woman. We had a little minivan and we had stopped to get her a sandwich and we were talking to her and she started freaking out. Well, we already, she smelled really bad and we thought she had scabies probably because she was real itchy. Could have been meth. But she was in the front seat. Was she in the front seat? No, she was in the back seat. Eric and I were in the front seat and Hannah, little baby Hannah, was in a car seat next to this woman who was freaking out, probably with scabies, like, I don't know what she's gonna do. I started to pull the car over so I could figure out what's going on with this woman, why she's freaking out in the back of my car. I pull over, switch seats, you sit here, Eric will sit with the baby, take her wherever she was going, try to talk to her, whatever, let her out of the car. And after that, Eric and I are like, mm, this isn't, a, this isn't something we should do with babies. I think we're gonna have to adjust something. And after that, she started staying home a lot more and caring for the children. We still have a lot of experiences ministering in the streets together, but, but that changed something. We had to do something different. There had, to, there had to be some different roles once there were different people to take care of. That's our experience. But let me tell you another thing. I got a call in January from Matt Hofer, about 6 a.m. in the morning. And he said, Matthew, Jerome's baby died in the night, last night. And we don't know what to do. And I said, I'll be there as soon as I can. So I got online and I bought tickets, one for me and one for Chloe Ann. And we left that day and we went straight to Minneapolis. We got there in the evening and we walked into a house of mourning and we wept for days. And there were dozens of times in that week that I was there where Chloe Ann was able to go in and hold her and talk to her and help her in ways that I never, ever could have. It would have been completely inappropriate for me to do that ministry. She was essential and vital for the ministry that the church needed to pour into that wound in that place. And I could not have done it without a single woman by my side or my wife. I needed a woman is my point. Who's gonna Who's gonna tell a nursing Who's gonna talk with a nursing mother who has a, who's lost her infant? How to How to deal with that? Yeah. 
So, so there, was no, there was nobody else that could have done that. I had another experience recently where, um, where because of the ministry that was needed, the same situation, that two single women helped me side by side in ministry to deal with a, with, a, with a debilitating situation where sin was involved, where there were problems and wrecked lives, and it was the same kind of thing that I, I couldn't, I, I literally could not have done the work that needed to be done. The church absolutely needed women to be involved in that ministry. And so this is my life experience in ministry in the church. And, and so when I hear what's the role of women in the church, I'm like, everything, all kinds of stuff is the role of women in the church. I, I'm, I'm in constant need of women in the church. The church is literally dependent on the ministries of women. For our families, our single women have all kinds of ministry and needs that, that, to, that, that, that they can minister into, that they can serve, that they can work, that nobody else can. Who's going to go back, back in Kampala? Who's going to go with a pregnant woman who's choosing not to have an abortion to talk to her family and tell them that she's not going to have an abortion, that she has to leave school, that she's going to sit in a room and be yelled at by her parents? Who's going to hold her hand? Who's going to put their arm around her? Who's going to help her walk through that pain and difficulty? Our women in the African church do. That's who does. That's who does. 